years. Uh, my name is Mark Smith, and I'm the director and state librarian for the Texas State Library and Archives Commission. And it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you to this really cool virtual event we're doing today. It's great to have all of you with, with us. Uh, we're doing this as a way to celebrate not only National Poetry Month, which comes around every April, but this is also National Library Week, so it gave us an opportunity to celebrate two important uh, events in, uh, in, this, in this way. Uh, I want to start by thanking the national student poet, Louis Lafair, uh, who's one of our participants today, and you're going to hear from Louis shortly. Uh, Louis suggested that we do something uh, from the State Library to celebrate uh, National Poetry Month and poetry in general. So we thought that was a great idea, and our communications officer, Cesar Garza, uh, suggested the idea of doing a Google Hangout. Uh, so uh, here we are, but I want you to please bear in mind that this is a new technology for us, and uh, at, at least it is for me. So I, I want you to, to be patient with us, but uh, hopefully this will be fun. Uh, so here's what we're going to do today. Uh, in addition to myself, we have seven people uh, today who are going to share a poem with you. And uh, following uh, reading the poem, then they're going to tell you a little bit about why they think that poem is important. And, and why it's important to them. Uh, we got this idea for this format from the former U.S. Poet Laureate Robert Pinsky, who had a project when he was Poet Laureate called the Favorite Poem Project. Uh, and he went all over the country and got people to talk about the poems and, and how they interested them and so forth, people from all walks of life. So we hope you enjoy this today. We have a lot of ground to cover, so uh, without further delay, I'm going to kick things off. And the poem that I'm going to read is an Emily Dickinson poem, and I want to hold up my copy of Emily Dickinson so you can see that it's kind of very well-worn copy. I've had this, this book since college days, and in fact, the, the back cover is falling off. I use it for the bookmark. <laughs> so uh, the, the poem is called The Brain Within Its Groove. It's uh, for Emily Dickinson aficionados. It's, it's poem 556. The brain within its groove runs evenly and true. But let us splitter swerve twere easier for you to put a current back when floods have slipped the hills and scooped a turnpike for themselves and trodden out the mills. I like this poem for three reasons. Uh, first of all, um, Emily Dickinson is um, considered one of the United States' most beloved poets. In fact, uh, a lot of people feel that, along with Walt Whitman, uh, she is one of the two greatest influences on, on all of American poetry. And uh, she wrote um, in her uh, writing career almost 1,800 poems. But during her lifetime, only about a dozen of those poems were published. So to me, that stands as kind of a testament to how a powerful and profound writing can, can outlive a person and, and ultimately take on a, a life of its own. The second uh, thing I like about Dickinson in general, and this poem in particular, every word counts. Uh, her poems are very short, but every word packs uh, a lot of meaning, and in fact, oftentimes multiple meanings. Uh, and that, uh, I think, is the essence of poetry. It's, it's endlessly fascinating, it's simple yet complex, and something that you can return to over and over again through, throughout your life and, and read and enjoy. And the third thing that, that I think about this poem and, and why I chose it to read today is, is that the poem is about how most of the time a person's brain, that is to say their mind or their intellect, moves along a single track. It's kind of harnessed and contained. But if something unexpected were to come up, uh, a splinter, as she calls it, to force the brain out of its groove, then this power of the mind becomes this huge force, like a, a flood uh, or a current, as she calls it, uh, that cannot be contained or put back in that narrow track. Uh, to me, poetry itself is kind of like that splinter that can, can sort of force our minds out of the narrow track and, and unleash that full potential. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure that today we're going to hear a number of such powerful splinters, if you will, from, from our participants. So with that, I want to go uh, to our, our first reader, and that is going to be uh, Louis LaFerre. Uh, Louis is a, a senior at St. Stephen's High School in Austin. Uh, he's the editor of Proteus, his high school's literary magazine. And uh, Louis is also a 2013 National Student, student Poet. 
and we're pleased to have him with us today. Louis, it's all yours. Perfect. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you to everyone who's watching. Um, so yeah, I love poetry. I had a really hard time choosing just one, actually, um, just one poem. But I, I went ahead with uh, Billy Collins' introduction to poetry, in part because it's become such a classroom staple, in part because I think it really uh, kind of captures the way I view poetry as a whole. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and read it for you. Introduction to Poetry. I asked them to take a poem and hold it up to the light, like a color slide, or press an ear against its hive. I say, drop a mouse into a poem and watch him probe his way out, or walk inside the poem's room and feel the walls for a light switch. I want them to water ski across the surface of a poem, waving at the author's name on the shore. But all they want to do is tie the poem to a chair with rope and torture a confession out of it. They begin beating it with a hose to find out what it really means. All right. Um, so most of my friends actually don't like poetry. I'm working on that. Uh, but I think in part it's because of kind of what the end of this poem says is, is they're all they're so concerned and, and in the classroom we're so concerned with what do these poems mean instead of reading poems for the first time and just asking how do these poems make you feel and what are the beautiful lines in them. And, and I mean, I think... Um, today, there, I mean, there are so many ways to experience poetry, and I mean, I think just some of the lines here, like a color slide or a press an ear against its head, I mean, Collins uses so many kind of different, um, different metaphors and images, I mean, I think it's pretty incredible. Of course, the irony is, is that here I am, close reading, analyzing the poem um, that discourages necessarily close reading poetry. Um, but I mean, I think the, wor the world is moving so fast, um, and, and so for me, really, poetry is a chance to step back, um, and to pause and to experience um, to experience the world uh, at, a, at a different pace. And so, I mean, having a chance to, to read poems again and again and to walk, look at them in all of these different ways, um, I think is really what roots us to our humanity um, in a lot of ways. And, and so every single poem really means something different to every single person. Um, and, and, I mean, I think that's why I'm really excited to hear about everyone else's poems here today is because each poem really sticks with or impacts you, or, or people hold on to them in a different way. Um, and so that's kind of why I love Introduction to Poetry and, and a lot of different poems for different reasons. So, um, I'll go ahead and pass it on uh, to the next person. I don't know, I think Sean is next. Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and introduce our next reader is uh, Shauna Butler. Uh, Shauna is curator of TEDx Austin and a self-described word nerd and poetry junkie. So I think uh, Shauna should fit in just perfectly with this group today. So Shauna, what do you have for us? A couple of things. Um, some thoughts before I share with you. Um, when I am in doubt. And one of the things that I find fascinating about words, poetry in general, is that it is those moments of existential um, questions when we are in doubt, uh, when we are experiencing joy, uh, when we try to find sense, uh, meaning, and, and sense-making, we frequently are searching for words. We have an emotional experience, and we look for those words to articulate. And most of our experiences are um, universal, and they have been felt throughout time. And that's one of the things that I love about the power of poetry is that from way, way, way back, when you read Hafez, or you read any of um, the, the ancient Greek poets, they are able to capture that timeless sense of searching for meaning and making sense, and capturing an emotional experience in words. So the, the, the reason, and again, as, po as uh, Lewis said, asking uh, what is a, a, a favorite poem, I don't think I ever say a favorite poem. Here's a poem that I, that I love, that I enjoy, that I want to share. And this is uh, by a, a New Zealand poet, a living poet, who's also a physician. And I come from um, a clinical background and uh, lived in New Zealand for seven years, have dual citizenship. And when I moved there, one of the things that I wanted to do was understand that culture through its arts and reached out to the poets and listened to them. And I found so much more meaning, and in particular in that clinical realm. Um, and I actually just, I called Glenn had a Skype chat, chat with him yesterday to ask him to share with me some of his insights, and it was a, a fabulous conversation. But why I chose the When I Am in Doubt is that it really captures so many things that we feel as 
people who are trying to we, we are often thought of as experts and people expect us to be experts but what happens when the experts don't feel so expert so this poem by um, Glenn Colhoun um, he wrote this in his very early days he says crying out as a young physician and it meant something he said you know many of his works they change over time they have different meanings but this one has grown up and it it has grown into itself and it remains the same and I asked him what voice he reads this in. I, I hear so many different voices in this. And um, he says it, it embraces doubt in, it, in, in many ways. And as he's grown in his professional career, he appreciates doubt in different ways. So this is When I Am in Doubt, a poem for surgeons. When I am in doubt, I talk to surgeons. I know they will know what to do. They seem so sure. Once I talk to a surgeon, he said that when he is in doubt, he talks to priests. Priests will know what to do. Priests seem so sure. Once I talked to a priest, he said that when he is in doubt, he talks to God. God will know what to do. God seems so sure. And once I talked to God, he said that when he is in doubt, he thinks of me. He says, I will know what to do. I seem so sure. Uh, one of the questions we were asked to think about is why poetry matters and in those spaces where you're taking care of people who are in need um, frequently we, we look to the tools and the techniques and the trade that we have and oftentimes they aren't enough and it is our words and ours our comfort and being able to embrace that doubt and take those words and provide um, a, a safe space to be when the words are all that we have. So that was, again, just one of the reasons why I wanted to share this when I am in doubt, because certainly we all have moments of doubt and how we embrace it and how we uh, move through it. I, thought, I, I find this very helpful. So, and again, I want to say thank you to all those folks who are out there uh, paying attention to this. We uh, welcome you into our culture of word loving. So thank you. Yes. Thank you, Shauna. That was beautiful. Okay, so our next reader uh, is Bobby Williams. Uh, Bobby is the Reference and Instruction Librarian at UT Permian Basin Library in Odessa, Texas, and she is uh, very interested in computers and social media, and we're eager to find out what she's going to share with us today. Bobby? Hello, thank you. My friends, if you'll give me two and a half moments of your time, I wish to express and read to you a psalm of life by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow and I'll talk about this when I'm complete. Tell me not in mournful numbers life is but an empty dream for the soul is dead that slumbers and things are not what they seem. Life is real, life is earnest and the grave is not its goal Dust thou art, to dust returnest, was not spoken of the soul. Not enjoyment and not sorrow is our destined end or way, but to act that each tomorrow find us further than today. Art is long and time is fleeting and our hearts, though stout and brave, still like muffled drums are beating funeral marches to the grave. In the world's broad field of battle, in the bivouac of life, be not like dumb driven cattle, be a hero in the strife. Trust no future, howe'er pleasant, let the dead past bury its dead. Act, act in the living present, heart within and God or head. Lives of great men remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing leave behind us footprints in the sands of time. Footprints that perhaps another sailing o'er life's solemn main, a forlorn and shipwrecked brother seeing shall take heart again. Let us then be up and doing with a heart for any fate, still achieving, still pursuing, learn to labor and to wait. I look to poetry 
for rhythm and cadence and it brings about an order in thought. It's very engaging and this particular poem to me was a very practical sense of motivation. I um, am not too interested in motivation unless it's realistic. Um, it has a sense of realistic spirituality to me and that spoke to me. My uh, personal motto is always make a difference and this poem really spoke to that but it I will tell you I had to look up a word or two uh, to get the definition it has an ancient way of speaking that but it was still very realistic and I thank you for your time and I'll pass it back to you now Thank you, Bobby. I, it's nice to see you read a um, Longfellow poem. He's a poet that I think has been unfairly neglected in, in, our, in our history. So the next reader uh, is Michelle Cooper. Uh, Michelle is a, a school librarian working at the Henderson Middle School in Henderson, Texas, and an ardent spokesperson for information literacy and education. Michelle, go for it. Uh-oh. We can't hear you, Michelle. Sorry. Is that better? There we go. Perfect. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you. I'm honored to be here with you today. And I chose The Charge of the Light Brigade by Alfred Lord Tennyson because it's always been one of my personal favorites. Um, just to give you a little history of the background of the poem, this was during the Crimean War in 1854. And this particular battle um, was the British troops and the Russian troops. And um, through a miscommunication of orders, the British troops uh, charged into a valley that was completely surrounded by the Russian troops. And because they were so dedicated, the soldiers just fought on. So their bravery is um, immortalized in this poem. When word got back to Britain, Alfred Lord Tennyson penned this poem. So let me read it for y'all. It says, half a league, half a league, half a league onward, all in the valley of death rode the 600. Forward the light brigade, charged for the guns, he said, into the valley of death rode the 600. Forward the light brigade, was there a man dismayed? Not though the soldier knew, someone had blundered. There's not to make reply, there's not to reason why, there's but to do and die. Into the valley of death rode the 600. Cannon to the right of them, cannon to the left of them, cannon in front of them, Volleyed and thundered, stormed at with shot and shell, boldly they rode and well. Into the jaws of death, into the mouth of hell, rode the six hundred. Flashed all their sabers bare, flashed as they turned in air, sabring the gunners there, charging an army, while all the world wondered. Plunged in the battery smoke, right through the lines they broke. Cossack and Russian reeled from the saber stroke, shattered and sundered. Then they rode back, but not, not the six hundred. Cannon to the right of them, cannon to the left of them, cannon behind them. Volleyed and thundered, stormed at with shot and shell, while horse and hero fell. They that had fought so well came through the jaws of death, back from the mouth of hell. All that was left of them, left of six hundred. When can their glory fade? Oh, the wild charge they made. All the world wondered. Honor the charge they made. Honor the light brigade, noble six hundred. And I just think he did a great job immortalizing their bravery, and almost half of them perished in that battle. So. Okay, Michelle, thank you very much. I think that was an excerpt of that poem. Am I right? Yes. It's, yes, it's, only, it's a longer. It's a longer poem. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. So. Uh, next up is going to be Robin Stauber. Ro Robin is adult services librarian at the Patrick Heath Library in Bernie, Texas. Uh, Hi, how are you guys? Robin up here. So she uh, wanted to mention that uh, Robin uh, founded a poetry club called Bernie Beat uh, okay. that meets the first Monday of every month there at the at the library. So Robin, uh, what are you going to share with us today? Okay. Um, I'm a, what I want to share today is Mary Oliver, who actually I, I discovered through the Bernie Beat. It's kind of funny sometimes when you're a public librarian, it's hard to know what programs are going to, uh, to resonate 
with people. And when I started the Bernie Beat in 2007, I, I actually thought it would be a fun way for a harried moms like myself to get together over a cup of coffee in the morning. And, and because we didn't have a lot of time to read lengthy tomes, book clubs were kind of out for us, but I thought maybe we could do poetry. And I had not one mother come. <laughs> but slowly but surely, um, other people joined and I think the first month I had two, two that came and then you know after that it just kind of slowly built and now every month we have anywhere between 10 and 15 that come um, a lot bring their own work um, so we share back and forth with each other a lot of times we have themes sometimes we just bring in favorite favorite poets and I've been introduced to a lot of different poetry through the group and through other people's favorites and one of the ones that was introduced to me through the group was um, Mary Oliver. And Mary Oliver is a National Book Award winner. She's a Pulitzer Prize winning poet. Um, she was born in Ohio in the 1930s. She still lives in Massachusetts in Provincetown, I think. Um, and I think one of the things that I love about Mary Oliver is I'm not a um, what I would call an organized religious person, but I am spiritual. And I find a lot of spirituality through reading poetry. And I find a lot of spirituality in, in Mary Oliver's poetry. And we kind of feel the same things, you know, that kinship with nature and um, finding God, you know, in those, in those places among the woods. And so her, her poem here is called The Summer Day. Um, it came out in her 2008 book called The True, True Robert and Other Adventures, Poems and Essays. Okay. Who Made the World? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean. The one who has flung herself out of the grass. The one who is eating sugar out of my hand. Who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down. Who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I've been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Um, I read that poem a lot to my children, actually, <laughs> just to kind of remind them um, um, of uh, uh, things that are important. And in an interview that Mary Oliver did with Mariah, Maria Shriver a few years ago, she called herself a praise poet. And she said, I acknowledge my feelings and gratitude for life by praising the world and whoever made all these things. And then she went on to talk about how she finds her spirituality by walking in the woods and, and that she is more comfortable in nature. She's a very quiet, uh, seclu um, secluded person by nature. Um, but she also talked about how she opens every morning with a notebook to watch the sunrise and just an appreciation for all the beautiful things in the world. And... Um, it's a form of prayer, and it's a way to stop and silently take in each moment and to acknowledge and appreciate the beauty of life. And I find myself doing that a lot with poetry. In fact, that kind of idea of quiet gratitude, and, when he, and you know, I tend to, and I don't really know that I'm doing it until I realize while I'm on camera that I'm doing it, I tend to bow my head a lot while other people are reading their poems because I want to stop and I want to make sure I understand each word. And it's the way that I can kind of stay focused and, center, and centered. And... Um, I think that's it. I mean, I think that that's a lot for me. Why poetry matters um, is it's a way for me to take stock. It's to help me find a center. It's a way to experience calm. Ta-da! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Robin. Um, Shauna, Shauna uh, noted uh, while you were reading that that um, she said, "I heard Mary Oliver read this live. It was breathtaking." Oh. And uh, that that's that's really cool. Um, Thank it, you. It's a beautiful poem. I, one of my favorites too. So next up is Sonia Schultz. Sonia is librarian at the Mike Moses Middle School in Nacogdoches. 
She is a writer herself, and she maintains a blog called I Love This, The Sassy Bibliophile. <laughs> okay, Tonya, you're up. Hello, hello. Um, I am so excited to be part of this. This is thrilling. Um, today I'm going to be sharing one of my all-time favorite poems. It is called Knoxville, Tennessee, and it was written by Nikki Giovanni, who is a genius, and I love her. Um, and I love this poem for many reasons that I'll, I'll talk about a little bit after I read it. I always like summer best. You can eat fresh corn from daddy's garden and okra and greens and cabbage and lots of barbecue and buttermilk and homemade ice cream at the church picnic and listen to gospel music outside at the church homecoming and go to the mountains with your grandmother and go barefooted and be warm all the time not only when you go to bed and sleep. Um, I love this poem because, number one, um, it is basically my childhood encapsulated in a poem. Um, it's, it's so beautifully talks about this sort of universal experience of the innocence of childhood, and there's this wistful longing um, that I think comes through beautifully. And that even if it wasn't your experience, even if you didn't have this beautiful, idyllic childhood, you can experience um, what it feels like to go back to a simpler time and just enjoy the, the feeling of the sun on your cheeks and, and the coolness of the ice cream as it hits your tongue and, and the tang of the barbecue. It's just, this poem is you know, really visceral for me. I, I, um, I'm immediately there and experiencing experiencing all of it all over again. Um, and I think the rhythm of the words, it, it's a lovely poem to read aloud. It's just, um, it feels good to have the words rolling rolling off your tongue. And I think Shauna mentioned earlier that poetry captures an emotional experience in words. And um, that's what this does for me. So I, I can't read this poem without a smile on my face and remembering uh, lovely times um, picking daisies in the field and listening to the music coming out of my grandfather's church. Um, so, so thank you for allowing me to share that. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. That, that was beautiful. So I'm sorry to say that we're down to our last reader, and that is going to be uh, Howard Marks. Uh, Howard is originally from Los Angeles. Uh, but he comes to us today from Snyder, Texas, where he serves as Director of Library Services at Western Texas College. Howard, what do you have for us today? Uh, oh, oh, I think we got an audio problem. Let's see. Howard, can we hear you? Let's see. Try to say something, Howard. Yeah, it's breaking up. Hmm. Hang on just a sec, Howard. Hang on just a sec. I think you're breaking up. Hold on just a sec. Um. Audio is okay. Let me let me turn you off and then maybe turn you on again. Try uh, Howard, Howard. Try turning off your audio and turning it back on again. Let's see if that works. Hmm. That's too bad. Um, well, you know, I told you we were. Gonna we were prone to a technical glitch, and um, so just be patient for a second. Um, try. This is microphone settings, or he's just not up right now. It appears it seems like he's turned it off. Let's see. Well, you're working on that. You want one of us to share something? Do you want to read his uh, Mark's point? Yeah, yes. Um, Please, Shauna, and I'll tell you what, I will, um, 
while you're while you're sharing something, we'll try to get Howard's poem, and if and in case he can't read it, we'll read it for him. That well, that's what I was hoping because he picked a really <laughs> fabulous one. I wanted to make sure we we included exactly. It. Um, when we were talking about food, one of the things that I just really love, Sonia, is um, the way you captured the the taste and how it feels when it literally, I mean, the words rolling across your tongue. And um, when I was working with a couple of uh, uh, speech coaches, I mean, with, with the TED programming, we work with a lot of speakers. And one of the coaches, I heard her say to the speaker, do your words. And I just think that that's such a fabulous thing when you think about, you know, when you ask people to ingest and to take this on board, that you do your words. And uh, one of the things that I fell in love with, a pizza place in New Zealand, every time they served you your pizza, it came with a poem. Oh, and, I love that. Yeah, pizza and poetry. So you, you, and it had, you know, it wasn't, it was just this really wonderful way to start a conversation. So I love to take guests there because they always, they always had the conversation started, whether I knew these folks or not. There was this fabulous moment. And the woman who was uh, the owner of this place, she always found these fabulous pieces to read. And I think some of my favorite ones I discovered at a at a pizza place. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, That's good. yeah. So I'm thinking, you know, keep Boston weird. I'm wondering when we'll start having, you know, uh, a, a trough that has pizza and poetry. Um, I love the idea. How are we doing on getting Matt's poem up? Well, I don't know. We're looking. We're looking for Howard's poem too. Howard, while yeah. while while he works, Howard, do you want to try again? No. And you know, it's funny. In the test, uh, Howard came out fine. So he turned something off or something. Well, I this this is Caesar. Okay. Um, this is a poem by Marge Piercy, and it's called "To Be of You." The people I love the best. Jump into work head first without dallying in the shallows and swim off with sure stokes, almost out of sight. They seem to become natives of that element, and the black sleek heads of seals bouncing like half submerged balls. I love people who harness themselves, an ox to a heavy cart, who pull like water buffalo with massive patience, who strain in the mud and the muck to move things forward, who has to who do what has to do again and again. I want to be with people who submerge in the task, who go into the fields to harvest and work in a row and pass the bags along. We're not parlor generals and field deserters, but move in a common rhythm when the food must come in or the fire be put out. The work of the world is common as mud. Botched, it smears the hands, crumbles to dust, but the thing worth doing well done has a shape that satisfies, clean and evident. Greek amphoras for wine or oil, Hopi vases that held corn are put in museums. But you know, they were made to be used. The pitcher cries for water to carry and a person for work that is real. So uh, my hat's off to Caesar for pulling off the technical pieces of bringing us all together. <laughs> Absolutely, thank you very much. We're going to try, okay, let's see, Howard's gone off, and he's going to try to come back on. Perfect. And if he does not come back on, I've got his poem that I'm going to read, which is by Kurt Nesset. Okay. And it is a great poem. Okay. Howard. Hi. Hey. Hi. All right. Hi. <laughs> You're on, my friend. All right. Um... Uh... Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Sorry for the technical difficulty there. Very excited to be here. I will be reading a poem on behalf of Mr. Kirk Nesset. He is a, an instructor, English instructor at Allegheny College in Pennsylvania, and we had the pleasure of having him here at Western Texas College as a guest speaker. Um, and... Well, sorry about that. Uh, it is called Time on the Down of Plenty. On Slaughter Beach, I lay me down on the sand between surf and Kaleope. 
There, where Oceana meets glitz, plastic mosques and minarets and transvestals, subverts, countersexuals, spanky sparkle nuts, after birth boy and crab apple, Candace the Grimace, and she who eats only fish. Nighttime it was, brine sour. <laughs> Let me continue here. <laughs> the one time the phone rings, right? And, and during the day, or one of the three times. Nighttime it was, brine sour, my head sunk in shadow. Above, boardwalkers walked, cat calls and titters. Such was my time on the down of plenty. Such is my way when inwardness knells. How had I let myself poison my passion? How had I failed to feel knees in the dust? What's done's done said my head, just do what you do. Mingle with toothless epicures, enough moral engorgement. The camel and gnat strain on as they must. The sea, neon tinged, hisses. And the misshapen champion, feckless, undaunted, plucked, cavorts in his fiberglass grotto, flexing his liver, his terrible guts. And here's a word from the author. I found this, personally, I found this poem to be descriptive and passionate, and it really describes a day or a night at the sea very well. Uh, and, and for those of you, uh, if you picture yourself out on the coast and your thought process, and this is, I believe, written from a male perspective uh, also, um, now, this is what Kirk Nesset has to say about it. I can say in that untrustworthy untru way any writer might say about his or, own, his or her own work that this piece, the volume's first poem, as an invocation or turning fork for the book illuminates, because it is a book of poems, St. X, illuminates the problem of lost innocence due to too much inwardness, as the poem puts it. In a kind of collapse in a tacky liminal zone, the speaker at once recriminates and exculpates himself, trying and failing, it seems, to buy his own innocence back, embodied in or refracted by, as the case or may or may, or may not be, the misshapen champion, quote-unquote, in the poem's final lines, a figure externalizing what's internal in a public, strikingly exploitive way. Uh, and I think that as we go through society, the poetry is within us and sometimes never comes out, or it may come out in a physical manner. But uh, what's interesting is that we are taking a craft that's 100 years old and bringing it back to the modern technology age. And just the dichotomy between those two is, is a very powerful thing. So I, I give my hats off to all, each, each and every one of you. Did a wonderful reading today. Uh, Mark, thanks again. Mark and Caesar, thanks again for putting this on. And Take it away. Thank you, Howard. That was great. I'm glad we finally got you online. That was that poem was worth waiting for, for sure. <laughs> um, Thank I, you. I, I wanted to, we got a little extra time, and I, I appreciate everybody uh, reading within their time, and, and we've actually got a, a bit of time left. So I wanted to, I've got a couple of questions to ask the group, and maybe we can have just a little bit of a, of a conversation for a few minutes. Uh, and... Um, I, the first question I have for the group uh, is, I sometimes hear people say that that they feel intimidated reading poetry, that maybe it's like uh, something that 
really should only be for people that are really brainy and, and really smart and able to understand and they can't understand poetry and it seems really difficult to them. Um, not something for ordinary readers. Uh, what would anybody here on our panel say to that comment? I'll be happy to jump in on that one. Um, Go so ahead, John. I was not a reader growing up. Um, came from a household that didn't have readers. There weren't books, and reading for me was you read what you needed to read in order to take a test. Um, it was there was no such thing as fiction. It was nonfiction. Um, it re spent time spent reading was not time well spent. And it wasn't until my adult years and having children that I got introduced to words and to books and to poetry. And um, I think back to Dr. Seuss and Jack Kulevsky, a pizza, you know, a pizza the size of the sun, uh, um, Ride a Purple Pelican, all of those really wonderful things that now with uh, my oldest one is, is 24, we still can recite those things together. And so it was this door that got open for me. And I so love that I was introduced to poetry through children. Um, so this idea that it's uh, only accessible, and actually in most, uh, if you look back through civilization, when we didn't have a literate population, it was through telling these stories, and most poems were song. Mm -hmm. And it was that rhythm and that cadence. And that was where stories were shared and feelings were expressed, and myths and legends. So it, poetry is actually for our, designed almost for our least literate or our very early literate folks. So I would counter that and say, oh, no, 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 come on in. The water's fine. <laughs> Anybody else? Lewis, how about our, our yeah, national school of poetry? No, you have a comment, I mean, have I, a comment for that? I mean, I think everyone's so hesitant at first. Um, and I've definitely, I've definitely seen it among other high school students. But once you jump in, I mean, I think it's just such an incredible community, the people we have here today. Um, and, and poets and readers of poetry kind of get so much closer together instantly, and they are also supportive and in, in many ways so down to earth, and they take the time to read and to, to experience. And I think as soon as you get over the fact that there is no right, there are no right answers to poetry, um, there's just experiencing poetry. I mean, I think that, that takes away the hesitation. Um, and as soon as you jump in, there's just a whole world kind of waiting. Wonderful. What about our school? What about our school teachers? What What do you tell your students about our our, our, our teacher librarians? I should say. What do you tell your, What do you tell your students about poetry? And, and do, is there is there an interest among students in reading poetry? I think there is. Um, I think there's a huge interest. I think it's just getting it out there to them. Um, for Poetry Month, we have poems all over the library, and they. Uh, come in and they get one every time they come check out a book and um, they can write their own. We have a haiku wall right now and all the students are writing their own haiku poems and putting them on the wall and they need to realize that it's it's something they can do. It's accessible. And it's a great way to share um, their emotions and their feelings and um, their joys. Mm -hmm. one, thing, one thing that I think is fascinating, I don't know how many of you have seen the viral poetry videos, um, but there have been a lot of slam poems recently that have, mm -hmm. that have reached millions of views. Yeah. Um, and so those are kind of gaining such a widespread audience. And so at least through, um, through these spiral slam videos online, um, Taylor Molly and Shane Koigzan um, and several more, uh, people, are, people are gaining more experience um, with poetry kind of just right in their face, um, which I think is incredible. Right. Um, I would just add, you know, being a, a middle school librarian, we have a, a pushpin poetry wall right now on a giant, giant bulletin board. And um, I had a student who came in and said, you know, I, I can't write poetry. And I said, you know what, I bet, I bet you can. And she went over and played with it. And she has come back every day during her lunch period to make a new poem because once she found that it was fun and once she, she, let her mind be playful about it instead of feeling fear of whether or not it was going to be right. Um, once she just experienced the playfulness of it, she was in love with it. And and that I think that's the thing. And and hearkening back again to what Shauna said with the music, um, 
kids love teenagers, you know, love music. I love music. And when I explain to them, you know, lyrics are poems. Mm -hmm. They're poems. I think that helps them understand, too, that it isn't just something lofty for only the mum, 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 among us, you know, the, the, it, it makes it feel like something they can, they can experience and that's attainable for them. Yeah, I don't I was just going to say, also tell my young men that, you know, that's the way to win the ladies' hearts. Just start, start now. With <laughs> the... <laughs> Very good. Yeah, no, I mean, I completely view poetry as just the most accessible way to play with language, um, more so than any other medium, really. And uh, as, as soon as people realize that, I think you can just have fun with it. I think we're all writing poems all the time, whenever we, we see an image or overhear a conversation. Um, and so it's just a matter of somehow converting that from your mind onto a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. Poetry. Yeah, I just wanted to point out, you, you see it a lot in music and other arts particularly in songwriting um, and so it has become also more of a visual art with multimedia um, and, I, and I think that's worth pointing out uh, but we it, it's neat how we're taking it back to its very essence and um, you know like Shakespeare reading poetry and um, you know I mean it's it's been done for so long and um, it, it's kind of a, a lost art in the traditional sense, but it's it's also kept around um, in in the modern day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's great that we're having a Google Plus Hangout. This really <laughs> yeah gathering about poetry. Mm -hmm. uh, that's well, great. Yeah, One of the things that I wanted to to share is um, Garrison Keillor. So you know his uh, approach about English majors and his idea. I think he voices very well that some folks think that um, poetry is for the academic elite, that it's not very approachable. And I love what he wrote in his, um, for, in his foreword to uh, Good Poems, and he says that, I look at a truckload of poems to find a few thousand that I've read on the radio, and it's an education. First of all, most poems aren't memorable. In fact, they make no impression at all. Sorry, but it's true. They have brave blurbs on the back cover, right, with lyrical luminosity that reconceptualizes experience with cognitive beauty. But when you open up the goods, you can see that there's the evidence that somebody was there and it was an experience, but not that great interest to the passerby. He says, that sometimes, however, one is dead wrong. I've come to admire writers who talk a snoot like Raymond Carver and Charles Bukowski. Charles Bukowski said, there is nothing wrong with poetry that is entertaining and easy to understand. Genius could be the ability to say a profound thing in a simple way. And this is not what English majors like me cared to hear back when I was busy writing poems that were lacerating, opaque, complexly layered, and unreadable. <laughs> but, uh, I, you know, I, again, I think that uh, when people hear the word poetry, sometimes it's like hearing the word calculus. We get um, intimidated by the word poetry and think that maybe we're not capable when in fact sharing an emotion and simply saying something with a, a small set of words that are entertaining or memorable, that's, that's quite, a, quite a, an accomplishment. I have something to add briefly. Poetry, once you go, you get it. Mm -hmm. Very good, Bobby. Yeah, I, I tend to think, you know, for me, I, I always wish I could read more poetry, and, and um, my wife reads a lot of poetry, and and, um, and, and I always admire that, but I, I sort of, I read a lot of fiction, and so it, sometimes it's hard to get, and, and fiction, nonfiction, sometimes it's hard to get your mind out of that particular kind of mindset and, and get over to a different, poetry is definitely very much a different way of seeing the world, but I always love to read poetry because it shifts my focus and my, my thinking to a different different type of thing. I have, an, I have another question for the group. Uh, if, if someone, say one of your students or a friend of yours that didn't read much poetry, asked you for a, a great anthology of poetry that would be a good introduction, uh, to, for a casual reader, uh, something that would get them involved. Do you have any suggestions? Well, you know, one one that I actually go back to time and time again, and I, I don't have it. I was actually looking in the back to see if I have it here, and I don't. 
but um, every few years they put out the Poet Laureate anthology, um, and so it's the edited into kind of the best of the of the best of the Poet Laureates of, of the U.S. And I tend to rely on that one a lot. Every year during our poetry group, we always kind of, in fact, we did it just now in April for, for National Poetry Month, but we do kind of a poet laureate share so that everybody brings in a favorite poem and, and they all kind of, we kind of go around the route and it's a nice sampling of, of what's out there. Um, so that's one. Good. Well, while the rest of you are thinking of, of one, I, of course, I knew I was going to ask you this question, so it wasn't fair. <laughs> I have mine handy, um, and so I'll um, I'll mention that um, I, I, I particularly like this uh, collection called "Staying Alive." It's it's uh, subtitled "Real Poems for Unreal Times." It came out a few years ago, edited by Neil Astley, and uh, this is um, this is my wife's book, and you can I'll kind of hold this up here so you can kind of see how how many poems she. She's got uh, earmarked and, and noted and and, uh, and and just all of these these poems that she reads all the time. But I, I think this is a particularly good good anthology uh, from Miramax Books. Uh, it, um, it it's not it's got a nice mix of poems that are accessible and poems that are more challenging and 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 they're grouped thematically. So I think I think that's that's kind of cool too. So I would recommend Staying Alive as a as a good a beginning anthology for someone. Yeah. Anybody else? The, the two that I like, um, and I don't remember the editor of it, is birthday poems. Uh, oftentimes when we're trying to find meaning or we want to say something of import, it is around a birthday or some type of a milestone, and it's called birthday poems. And it covers the range of life experiences. And then um, uh, Garrison Keillor's Good Poems, and he also has another yeah. group, uh, Good Poems for Hard Times. Mm -hmm. and, uh, what I love about that is there's such an interesting range, and yes, there's some thematically based pieces. But I uh, then when you when you go and you pull up his his poems, um, frequently you can do a search on the writer's almanac, and it's one thing. And we haven't really commented on this, but presentation, and I think we hit a little bit about this. Every poem, it's kind of like you know when you hear. Uh, uh, a song that's endured for a long period of time, and then another artist comes in and does a cover. And there's so many different ways to have that song. So when you hear, a, when you read a poem, sometimes you have a hard time getting the rhythm, the cadence. And um, Edward Hirsch talks a lot about reading poetry out loud and how it is a spoken art form. So when you find these poems that you like in these anthologies, to go look for a recording of it, I think it helps find your own voice in that poem or. Um, a new uh, insight to it when you listen to others read it. You can hear different tones and different shades and different textures or different emphasis. So that's what I love about Garrison Keillor's anthologies is that frequently you can go find his reading of it and it deepens your understanding and gives you greater access to it. And to follow on what Shauna said, and we have the book in, in our library, and I'm sorry, I'm not, I might not get the title exactly right, but it's called, is it Poetry Speaks? Yes. yes where, you, where it's got the CD. Yeah. Poetry out loud. Poetry out loud is another one too. But the one that I, I was amazed by when I when we first got the book is um, that you can actually hear T. S. Eliot on there reading his poem, and I think he was reading The Wasteland. And I want to even say, and I could be wrong, it was either Tennyson or Whitman. It was like one of the first recordings that was ever made with those old scratchy whatever you call those kind of machines in the late 1800s um, and one of his poems is on there and you can hear him reading his own poetry and it's a pretty amazing thing. Have you heard the recordings of Shel Silverstein? Um, no, and, yeah. Okay, no child cannot love poetry when you hear, I mean I didn't think when I first heard it I thought this is comedy, this isn't poetry. Um, and all of Billy Collins, Collins' recordings and Coleman yeah. Barks' Rumi, oh my goodness. Yeah. I, love, I love listening to recordings of poems and watching videos. Um, and now with, I mean, now with the internet, we can do that with just almost any poem. Um, one thing, not a traditional anthology, but I really love poems a day, poem a day. Um, so stuff, mm -hmm. I mean, by, for instance, Academy of American Poets, you can just throw your email down and uh, get a poem a day. And they send you a poem a day, right? What? They, they send you a poem a day in your email, exactly. right? 
Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Um, so I think that's, I mean, that's a great way, for me at least, to get exposed to a lot more poetry. Thank you. Well, does anybody have any any parting words or, or any, any words of wisdom before we wrap up our, our Google Hangout? Any, any, anybody want to read a final poem? We might have time for one. Well, oh gosh. Oh, I've got a really lovely sentiment that says, this is by Sheena Pugh. It's called Sometimes. Sometimes things don't go, after all, from bad to worse. Some years, Muscadel faces down frost, green thrives, the crops don't fail. Sometime a man aims high and all goes well. A people sometimes will step back from war, elect an honest man, decide they care enough that they can't leave some stranger poor. Some men become what they were born for. Sometimes our best efforts do not go amiss. Sometimes we do as we meant to. The sun will sometimes melt a field of sorrow that seemed hard frozen. May it happen for you. Mm. Thank you, okay. Sean. Howard, it sounded like maybe you had one? Yes, sir. All right, go for it. Okay. This is called Some of the Most Striking Women I Have Known Have Been Men. And this is from the same <laughs> author. Doesn't necessarily, uh, it doesn't uh, capture my views, but <laughs> I'm, I'm doing this for the art of it. Thank uh, you for that disclaimer. It's right, the qualifiers. <laughs> okay. Uh, at Brass Rail Cocktails at Fult Fulton and Eighth, salmon and purple art deco across from the block long fake granite bank. They stare out through smoke. One muscular leg crossed on, on the other, black hair tumbling behind. The eyes haunt and enchant. At the professional conference, they quarrel. So smart, it hurts. The crying, the jellyfish theory, the Orphic pronouncements, evangelical Protestantism, toadstools, the canon and canon, skunks, canine and feline, and later, Chester, the six-foot mechanical chicken, swiped by kids off a roof. They hold difference aloft like a banner. They pause to salute it. A dozen or so lifetimes ago, who was so watchful as this? The hills hump their backs in the rain, sprouting venomous flowers. The ocean snoring and raving, at war with the glacier. The lean ghosts adrift, capsize, capsize, and raise, crashing their way up the beach. Daughters and sons of, of oblivion, wielding your scepters in Burbank and Kirkland. Will you still hunger, pray to the gnat and mosquito? Will you pawn your very loot for ten shillings? Will you still say, dying of thirst in salt water, here's where you finish, and here I begin? Wow. I think we'll let Howard take the last word on the, on the poetry <laughs> front here. I, I, don't know, I don't know how we're going to beat that one, so thank you, Howard. So I want to just say that I think that pretty much brings us to the end of our, our Google Hangout. And I, I want to I thank all the, the viewers that came in to join us today. And this will be archived and available, and, and hopefully uh, people can use it for programming or, or, or review later on. Maybe not, but you know, I know I had fun. And I want to uh, especially thank our readers, uh, Louis LaFaire, Shauna Butler, Bobby Williams, Michelle Cooper, Robin Stauber, Sonia Schultz, and Howard Marks for their time, their uh, poems, and uh, their, their good humor in going along with this and, and offering us their comments and insights in, in poetry. I want to I, I thank everybody for participating. So once again, it's Mark Smith with the Texas State Library and Archives Commission, and I want to wish everyone the best for National Poetry Month and National Library Week. And so long to everybody for now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.